Now for the final session of the day, we have a panel discussion. The topic is conceptualizing responses to sexual abuse of children in institutional care, prevention, investigation and rehabilitation. Our panelists for the day is Inakshi Ganguly from HUC. She is a human rights activist and child rights advocate, researcher and trainer for the past three decades working on a wide range of social legal, uh, social legal issues. Since co-founding HUC, Center for Child Rights in 1998, she has been working in a focused manner on children's rights. She has authored and co-authored a number of books and articles, presented papers at various national and international meets, and works closely with the UN system. She has been awarded the Ashoka Fellowship in 2002 in recognition of HUC's work with children. Our second panelist for the day is advocate Manisha Tulpule. She's currently working with Sehat as a legal advisor with Lawyers Collective as a consultant and as a chairperson in Child Welfare Committee, Raigarh. She has worked as Mumbai Municipal Prosecutor. She has worked with NGOs like Murti Sangatna. She is now working as an independent advocate from last five years in women's rights sector. Our third panelist for the day is Dr. Asha Bajpai. She is a PhD in law with specialization on child rights. She is the Dean and Professor of the School of Law, Rights and Constitutional Governance at TIS, Mumbai. Her areas of research include juvenile justice, child sexual abuse and exploitation, child labor, adoption and custody, violence and crime against women and children and many others. She is directing a field action project for rehabilitation of intellectually challenged, abused orphan children. She has been awarded the most outstanding contribution in the area of women and law and she was also awarded a Fulbright Visiting Lecturer Fellowship. Finally, this panel is going to be moderated by Mrs. Preeti Patkar. Preeti started Prena in 1986 that works on anti-human trafficking, child protection and gender-based violence against women and children in the red light areas of Mumbai. She was instrumental in setting up world's first night care center amidst the red light area for children of commercial sex workers. Under her leadership, Prena has been in the forefront in pioneering innovative models for protecting children from abuse and exploitation. I welcome all of you on stage. Thank you, Foundation, for putting together this panel and also timing it post-Arpan presentation. I'll tell you why. Why uh, I think it was, uh, it was well planned. Because in Arpan's presentation, there was one statement that Manjeer made and that was how children post the therapy or during the process of the therapy talk about this is safe for you compared to being outside. So institutions are supposed to be safe spaces for children. Children very often come to institutions thinking that they're coming to a safe place as compared to the outside world which has been so violent and so unfair against them. Uh, adults who push for children to stay in shelter homes also think so. And so do many stakeholders who are supposed to protect children's rights. We all together think that this is a safe place for children. And I just want to take you through a journey and start with the first case that really helped many child rights organizations in India to start looking at what is happening in childcare institutions. And the first case we're talking about is probably many of you know it and for all the youngsters who don't know it, um, Father Freddie Peets in Goa. He wasn't a father loved to call himself a father. Uh, he used to run an orphanage called Gurukul, an Anglo-German person with an Indian passport. So when this whole ca case came uh, into the limelight, we were all shocked that he had this Indian passport. We didn't know how did he have it. Uh, in 1991, boy, a resident of his shelter home, complained to his father uh, because they, uh, you know, he had a pain in his groin and he told his father that Father Freddy Peets and six other people in used to inject something into his testicles. Uh, this got discussed and uh, people, child rights activists, and I still remember how Sheila Barse worked on this case tirelessly 
and in 1991 uh, freddy peets was arrested all throughout he kept claiming that these were false allegations he was uh, i think in 1996 he was served life imprisonment for kidnapping abducting children for uh, selling them to foreign pedophiles for selling them uh, in prostitution for physically assaulting them and i think around when he was 81 years old he died in prison subsequently we and also rather uh, this freddy peets kept saying that uh, boys don't mind sleeping naked with us and he had this theory of body joy and we are going to be talking about this whole theory of body joy which i'm i'm once again seeing surfacing in shelter homes of late um subsequent to that we all um, heard about anchorage ca case right under our nose in the city of bombay with so many child rights alert active um, uh, members of the child rights organization two members um, both british nationals ex army men ex naval officers sexually uh, assaulting street children running this beautiful shelter home keeping these children in five star kind of uh, luxuries uh, after that we um, of course we heard about uh, the kaudas case and post kauda case we've been talking a lot about minimum standards prior to that sangeeta punekar uh, worked on a case we all worked on a case called prem sagar no, and that was the came. first time she's here she came and went okay that was the first time mumbai organization started talking about the need for minimum standards of care and protection in shelter homes uh, we are also going to hear from inakshi about uh, the arya orphanage case in delhi uh last year at um, the same forum we heard um, from the asian center for uh, uh human rights i think uh, he suha yeah he was talking about and used their report used this term the hell holes and he was talking about rampant sexual abuse among children in the government sponsored government aided uh, juvenile homes in the country uh, we also have seen i you know i can just continue i think uh, in the state in, in the country of india we've not had a single state which has not seen more than maybe 10 uh, such abuses in shelter home and experts say that uh, behind you know when every time a single case gets reported uh, there are at least 10 cases that don't go that that go unreported and i feel these are 10 cases which go unreported where the child where there is a disclosure but there are many 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 more cases where children are just experiences sec experiencing sexual abuse and are absolutely not talking about it at all uh today's panel we are here to discuss uh, like asuchi smita said we are here to discuss prevention we are here to discuss what are the challenges in inv investigation and we are also going to be talking about rehabilitation and reintegration uh my first question is to asha um uh asha i i want you to talk about the kaudas case especially uh, you were appointed to assist the bombay high court um can you share some of your personal insights from the from that point when the high court appointed you to assist them to understand this uh, you know the magnitude of this problem and and of, subsequently we would all like to hear about the orders as well that came uh, post your intervention in this case um kavda's case you all must have heard perhaps yesterday from the from the uh, from the reporter who first reported that matter in the in a in a mumbai mirror uh, there was a report in the mumbai mirror about uh, starvation deaths of five children in a home in kavda somewhere near thane which is a suburb of mumbai now when that matter was reported that five children had died and and the unhygienic conditions they were in and how uh, ma many more may die that was the report that came in the bombay high court chief justice took a so moto uh petition and a pil was fi uh, was done by the chief justice himself i was called to uh, come and assist the court as an amicus i went there and uh, i was asked to go and meet the children 
I would like to share with you what I saw when I went there. When I went to meet the children, by then they had been rescued from that home and, so, uh, and brought to another home where, where they were. It was a government home from where they were rescued. They were partly funded by the government and uh, they were supposed to be inspections that were supposed to happen there. Uh, and, but um, in spite of all that, you, I saw children when I entered that room. I had gone there along with the counsellor. When I entered that room, there were around 30 children in that room, but there was pin drop silence, absolute silence, not a word from any, what you call pin drop silence, I could hear there. And um, uh, when I went in, we told, I, we told them that, see, we have been asked to come to you, we, uh, to you, meet you, um, and we didn't say, ask them what has happened to you, because by then, what had happened to them, they had narrated to, to the media, they had narrated to the minister, they had narrated to the secretary, they had narrated to the probation officer, they had narrated to the CWC, they had narrated to so many people that we felt that we, it would be uh, um, a, a violation of their rights if we asked them what happened to you. We didn't ask them that. We just gave them some papers and crayon and we asked them to draw something. This was the first time many of them had taken a paper and a crayon in their hand. They are all orphans. They were all orphans. They were all intellectually challenged. Here, here we call the intellectually challenged homes as mentally deficient children's home. So in short, we call them MDC homes. So that somehow that word comes out, MDC homes. So they were all intellectually challenged orphans and who had gone through all this abuse. Some, some of them, um, they rushed to take the crayons and the, and the paper. And they start, we told them, you can write what you want, draw what you want. They had never written. They try, we had to tell them how to hold the crayon and how to hold the paper. After that, some of them drew. Some of them drew. And what we realized was, many of them used the color black. Though there were other colors along with the crayons, but they used the color black. And many of them drew homes. Those typical homes that we draw when we are small with a triangle on the top and a rectangular down. And they drew themselves out of the home. Many of the drawings were there. Some of them drew them running out of the home. Some of them drew somebody chasing them. So those kinds of drawings came to us. While they were doing it, gradually they, some of them started speaking to the counselor who was along with me. And some of them spoke to me. And we realized the abuse and the trauma that they had gone through. And we also came to know from the people in the home that the, they were so malnourished and they had faced so much of starvation and so much of abuse, physical as well as sexual, that the, when they entered this home for a few days, they were just eating and nothing else they were doing. So this is what had happened. And then when they were medically examined, they, it, it, was, uh, some, it was confirmed that some of them were sexually abused as well. And, and what, what bothered us was the words that were used by the medical personnel who examined them was habituated to sexual intercourse. These were the words that they were used, they, that, that was there in all the reports that came in. I think this is an area we, now we have, we are, people have started come out, coming out against these words. But these were the words that were there before us, that came before us when, uh, after the medical examination. Uh, uh, we went and gave this um, uh, report to the court. We asked a, a therapist to live and look at their drawings and see what could come out of it. We realized they all were in severe trauma, and that is why uh, this was the, 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 there was spin drop silence. We re realized later, at that time we felt many of them were speech impaired or uh, hearing impaired, but now later we realized once they were out of that situation, we realized that no, they were not speech impaired nor um, uh, uh, in this um, uh, visually impaired, uh, hearing impaired. They were in a trauma. They were in an absolute shocked state. That they, that is why they just couldn't speak. They were unable to speak. And and what was being used as a as a as a as a incitement or as a carrot for them for abuse was that if they if they given to the demands of the people whom they called mummy papa kaka mousi these are uncle aunts mom and pop they they were the abusers who abused them and and they told them that if you do not do what we say 
we you will not be fed you will not be given food so food was used uh, to say to uh, to make them do what they wanted to do this was what we heard from the children that we realized and after that we uh, we gave the report to the high court a committee was set up which we call the high court appointed monitoring committee this committee went round all we called mdc homes as i said all mdc homes in maharashtra and gave a report to the court and in the mm uh, report we realized when we went around all the mdc homes that situation was very bad throughout the states the situation was very bad there are ad hoc distribution of homes throughout the state they are not based on the need or the necessity they are based on maybe political considerations they are based on political considerations so you want a home here okay you get a home there and that's how the homes were and many of them were not funded completely by the government and uh, many of the staff there majority of the staff was untrained no uh, no edu right to education no right to play the uh, the uh, the persons with disabilities act was completely violated the right to education act was completely violated throughout the state and there was just one home where we found children going to school otherwise no so this is how the situation was throughout the state and uh, we, we we gave our report to the court and based on this report the court court has passed several directions and one of the direction was that we bring all these children together uh, as we were doing this study of the homes in maharashtra we realized we came across another home where we found 19 girls whom we suspected to be sexually abused and later we found yes they were abused these children were all brought together at, at the with the direction of the court in one place and we uh, started a rehabilitation project called chunati which will later perhaps i may talk to you a little more about it and but what we realized was that this was the first time intellectually challenged children came before the criminal justice system in our country a group of them there were around 30 of them and they came before the criminal justice system and uh, and the system had to deal with this for the first time perhaps i don't think in history there so many intellectually challenged children have come before the system to talk about the abuse that they have gone through and these children through various through various challenges that they faced in the system they expressed what they had gone through through sign language through various other methods they expressed to the before the court what they went through and they got a conviction so this is how there was death sentence as well there was um, uh, uh, life imprisonment as well and various other kinds of imprisonment but this has happened this is the the matter will be maybe appealed later but the pil is still going on why it is going on is because the the recommendations that we gave in our report for various homes we gave home wise region wise and state wise those recommendations are still being complied with by the government and that is why the court is still uh, monitoring the compliance of their uh, recommendations and the directions that they have given uh, this is what has happened in brief that that we went through during this matter My next question is to Inakshi. Uh, Huck has intervened uh, in one particular orphanage, uh, the Arya uh, Anathalai case in Delhi. Uh, can you tell us about uh, Huck's intervention in this particular case? Thank you, Preeti, and thank you for the foundation for inviting me to this panel. Um, I would begin by saying that there are. several types of institutions that are run in the country and uh, abroad there are those that are run by the government there are some that are run by charitable organizations some that are run by rights based organizations but traditionally all over the world running an orphanage was always seen to be the best form of charitable work that anybody could do you know it was god's own work so a lot of religious organizations politicians um various kinds of people who have no experience of working with children often also run orphanages and therefore what you do have um is a combination of often political power uh you have a combination of patriarchy political power paternalistic uh behavior 
and uh, religion all combining to come together often to run institutions and the story of Arya Anathala is typifies this example. Arya Anathala is one of the largest orphanages in Delhi. It is traditionally run by a family and it belongs to a certain, who belong to a certain Hindu sect, the Hari Arya Samaj. Uh, the family is extremely powerful because the gentleman was, is part of, at one point has been part of the ruling party. He is now dead. Uh, in the course of the case, he died. And uh, his sons and daughters and all are running this institution now. Um, he was an, uh, a secretary of the Bar Council, so he holds a lot of influence over the court and is, and is also a very influential family in that part of the city. So the story goes back a little bit, if you can give me, indulge me a bit. I mean, uh, uh, several years ago, we got a case, we, we work, Hug Center for Child Rights works with children who are both victims of abuse and we also work with offenders. So we got a child who was about 8 to 10 years old, indefinable age, who was brought to us as an abuser, as a sexual offender, having, we were told that he had, was from the, had uh, actually sexually abused somebody in Arya Anathale. The boy was so small that it was not, uh, we couldn't figure out what was happening, but through the course of it, he did tell us that it was not him, but there were some adults who had done it. But since there were no convictions, there were no trials, and it was not our job, we were working with the JJ system, we didn't quite know what was happening. But the boy went through his counseling sessions, and then the story was over, and we, we also put, it up, put, our, put our case files into our case file. About three years ago, suddenly, the police called us and said, can you help us to... Uh, investigate this case of a, of a death of a girl whose postmortem showed that she had been sodomized and raped and she was dead. Um, and the hospital, uh, the, the institution was saying that she had died, died from malaria or encephalitis or something like that, but the postmortem showed sodomy and rape. So the police came to us and said, can you help us to investigate? So two members from the police and two from our team, we would go to this institution and then we started to find that the children were complaining that they were being abused. And this gave, the minute the... Uh, the powers that be of the institution came to know that we were being told all of this, they stopped our entry into the institution. And so what we did do was we, we wrote a report, we gave it to the police and it just became a huge, you know, sometimes the media can play a good role and sometimes I don't know what, but it became the, the breaking news in the city for about a week. Everybody was talking about Arya Anathale and the largest orphanage and abuse and Huck Center for Child Rights. And they came on board to say that Huck Center for Child Rights was interested in destroying them because we are a Muslim organization. My co-director is Bharti Ali and Huck is an Urdu name. And so between us, we were wanting to grab the land and defame them. So this was this whole defamation angle to it. And as luck would have it, the DCP in charge was a Muslim woman too. So it just, so I'm just to, this all background is to give you what can happen when you are dealing with a case, right? So when nothing, the police was then asked to shut up. And so then nothing, the police just wasn't moving. So we sent an email petition to the Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court who took so much cognizance. And then for some reason, after four hearings in the chamber, which Arya Nathale asked for because they felt they were being defamed by us, um, he transferred the case on to somebody else. Now the interesting part is, in this time that we were slowly collecting evidence because a lot of people then started coming to us, old students, old inmates, current inmates, teachers who worked there started giving us evidence of different types of abuse that was happening and we collected all that evidence and gave it to the court. But the interesting thing is in the one and a half years or two years that the case went on, the court, high court did not take any cognizance of the criminal 
evidence that we gave to them. They treated the whole issue as a purely administrative matter. They put in place a judicial inquiry as well as an administrative inquiry. The administrative inquiry corrobor corroborated everything that we said, but that was brushed aside by the judicial inquiry, which was far more influenced by, um, in fact, people we know, but you know how things. And finally, what was said was told us, you are good people and they are good people. You are both doing good work. Can't we just decide on this? And, the, and although the workers who were the perpetrators and had been identified as such were suspended, there was no criminal charges that were carried forward. So, um, it is interesting that now they have, they were only told, they refused to file an, under the Juvenile Justice Act and that is the other point that I wanted to make to the House and I, we should remember that when we are dealing with child sexual abuse, we are not dealing with just the laws on child sexual abuse. We are dealing with the entire juvenile justice system and we have to have an equal understanding of both. So, this institution refused to be registered under the Juvenile Justice Act and they went to court saying we are not going to register. And so, the, the, so simultaneously two cases, yes, so simultaneously two cases went on, one in which we are trying to tell them that there is, has been a criminal offence, in the other that they are saying we will not become an institution under the juvenile justice law and therefore we can do what we want. And now as I speak to you, they are in Supreme Court they have gone in appeal to the Supreme Court. So, um, really the tragedy is, tragedy starts from the beginning, police suddenly becoming ineffective, um, the politicians not taking, the administration did not, I mean I personally must have made at least 15 phone calls to the minister in charge at that point and every time she would say I am going to do something but silence. So, when politics, religion, power come together, it's a very interesting cocktail. You can do nothing about it. Uh, yeah, Inakshi, some of the things that you uh, you mentioned uh, sound very familiar. Every time you're exposing the case of child sexual abuse in institutions, the first thing they accuse you of is grabbing land. Uh, I uh, Over to uh, Manisha. Manisha, you know Thana, for those who know Mumbai, uh, when I started work in 1986, I was looking at uh, shelter homes in Mumbai and there were in all 24 shelter homes in Mumbai. In the last over, I think, 10 years, a lot many shelter homes have cropped up in Thana district and Raigad district. I think Thana CWC chairperson is somewhere here and she deals with over 40 shelter homes in, in her district. Uh, Manisha has been the chairperson of the Raigad CWC and uh, since she has taken over, she has seen uh, almost two cases of child sexual abuse uh, or maybe three cases of child sexual abuse in institutional care. Uh, can you share uh, some of your experiences of how you handle these cases as, as a member of the Child Welfare Committee? Yeah, actually uh, you need to pay attention for what child is saying about that is very important. Uh, definitely uh, the recent case um, I am going to share with you, all of you. And the thing was that ke when a school teacher called us and said ke, uh, there was uh, adolescent education program in their school and now uh, one girl from children home uh, uh, and which is in their school, she is saying that she is abused physically as well as she is sexually also abused and not ready to go to children home back. Uh, so, uh, they inquired with uh, um, Sri Mukti Sangatna and who, who, who had conducted those, that program and then uh, took my our uh, uh, phone number and called CWC about it. So, uh, we said you produced that child before us, but uh, next day the child, uh, that girl, um, uh, she was not able to come to the school. So, we went there and we visited children home uh, after the meeting of child welfare committee. Uh, actually, uh, that children home was also not licensed children home. They have not, they have made the application to the, um, uh, for the license, but license was not given and it was in the process. Uh, when we visited, we found that 
uh, all the inmates, all the inmate children, they have not taken any uh, order of CWC, uh, Child Welfare Committee, and uh, there were no records um, of the children properly kept. We talked with the children, actually, and uh, we sent all the uh, trustees out, all the staff out, and only talked with the children, girl children uh, separately and boy, boys separately. Uh, at the time, uh, girls said that, Yes, there is a physical abuse, there is a sexual abuse and we want, still we want to continue in this children home and we want perpetrator out. So I said not immediately, we can't do, do that immediately but, but if you want we can take you to the safe place and at that time they were agreed and 11 girls and 8 boys were there and uh, uh, 11 girls and 7 boys were there. Uh, so, uh, just uh, actually, uh, when uh, nearest police station, definitely we were damn sure that police station will not respond because a single child labor case also they were not responding uh, since two years. So, uh, we were damn sure that police station will not respond. Uh, so, uh, actually, we called that uh, superintendent and ask them ki, uh, you produce the children immediately before child welfare committee because you are not produced you are not taken orders so uh, actually we came uh, with the accused only and uh, in the accused car uh, with the children in the child welfare committee's office because it was a distant place and children whom was at a distant place Mm, we went uh, at child welfare committee's office we asked all children to come inside and then kept accuse outside and then after uh, uh, when we kept the ch children inside then uh, we talked with the children and they said okay, they don't want to continue with their children home and it was an unlicensed children home so uh, we kept boys in the boys home uh, which was uh, which is attached in the child welfare committee office attached to child welfare committee office and it was uh, 8 o'clock in the evening, in the night. So, uh, in the Karjat, uh, we uh, made order of fit institution in the uh, women's shelter home and kept 11 girls there uh, for the night. And, uh, and then after, uh, we ordered uh, for medical examination of those girls. Actually, uh, you have to understand that they will not speak entire things because they will not have any... Um, confidence in the third person so at that time we just ordered for the medical examination of those children and uh, actually uh, definitely the WCD department and police and health department have not responded properly but still uh, within one week uh, health department or uh, that rural hospital made investigations and made medical examinations and forwarded uh, child welfare committee a report that there is a sexual abuse to the girls and under mandatory reporting uh, actually uh, when there is poxo in place now um, it is uh, quite okay and quite easy for child welfare committee to report the matters to the police station and under mandatory reporting we reported the matter to the police station uh, actually uh, police uh, um, police has not taken any cognizance of our complaint uh, health department and they have forwarded mlc but nobody collected the evidence from uh, hospitals WCD women and child development department was not responding because they were saying ki, what again the same thing what child welfare committee is doing and uh, these people are very good people and uh, then again all this religion discussion and all was going on uh, yes and in that situation actually uh, we uh, again uh, took the provision benefit of the provision of support person and we uh, appointed Navnihal Prerana as a support person in that matter, uh, shifted those girls to uh, Navnihal with the consent of the Navnihal because they were in the uh, women's shelter home. Uh, we shifted them there. And uh, then after when nobody was responding, the WCD department, police, no functionary was responding, uh, we appointed a committee of social workers because under JJ Act there is a provision uh, for appointing social worker and uh, otherwise PO 
for fact finding and what has happened in this case and we were able to uh, take the benefit of that provision and uh, uh, we requested uh, many many organizations social organization and representative of social organization to come on the committee so there was one vrishali magdum from sri mukti sangatna uh, jayant ruthe from childline uh, Jyoti uh, Patkar from Parivartan, which was uh, from the Thana district actually, both of them. Uh, and then uh, we requested Sehat and Lawyers Collective as an advisor to those committees. And we requested support person Prerna to work with this committee and with the children. Uh, it was very helpful for us uh, because immediately Sehat, one of the uh, advisory organizations, and Prerna, both of them uh, arranged for the uh, counselling and therapeutic counselling of the children. Uh, and from that, uh, children were able to speak about uh, what was the abuse and, uh, and both of them are present now to, in today's program actually. Uh, so both the counsellors are, are present and actually they uh, assured the children and what uh, Raute madam has said that is very important they assured the children that it is not their fault what has happened with the children and then after healing process started uh, so that was the thing uh, in that situation and the committee of social workers they came with us they uh, support person came with us and then they uh, approached higher authorities. So it is not a work of single person to take forward all this uh, child sexual abuse or institutional child sexual abuse matters. This we need teamwork of counselors, then lawyers, um, uh, health workers. We need all of them to take this matter ahead that I wanted to say. Thanks, Manisha. Um, uh, I want to come back to Asha. Asha recently, uh, part of her recommendation has recom has recommended to Bombay High Court. And I, you know, when I read it, Asha, in the newspaper, I was seeing, I was sensing some amount of frustration. Uh, she, she and her committee recommended to the High Court that they should directly supervise the functioning of childcare institution. And um, I'm sure all of us are very uh, you know eager to know what prompted you besides the frustration point to come i mean to come up with this recommendation uh, we are fortunate in this matter that the court has supported us and the court is the matter is still ongoing as a pil and that is why many of the directions that the court gave were being implemented only because it was a direction from the court. Once the court is out of this picture, I don't know whether we'll be able to continue what we are doing. Maybe nobody will even listen to what we are saying or even uh, entertain us in any way. But till till the court is with us, we have been giving a lot of uh, uh, a lot of recommendations to the court and getting it done. But we are fa what we realized was that we are in a in a we are a third party, as was said in the earlier. Um, presentation by Arpan in that home, but we have not been invited in that home. We have gone there, we have been put there forcefully by, by the court for rehabilitation of those abused children. So we are outsiders there, we are not welcome there, we are not wanted there. And what we are do and what we did, we did therapeutic counseling, we did life skill training, we did uh, training of the caretakers, we did positive disciplining training, all those trainings we did there. And this was never done before by the home. We have sent the children to school. They are intellectually challenged children, but we have used the Sarva Siksha Abhyan, which talks about inclusive education. And we are sending the children to school. So, uh, 25 children are going to school. Seven of them are now working for NIOS. It's very difficult for them. They are finding it extremely difficult. We have put uh, several t uh, special teachers for them. Even extra coaching is being given to them. And they will be trying their, luck, their best at the NIOS exam that is there. And some, one of the child stood top the school in spite of all the challenges that we faced with the teachers, with the school. Nobody wanted them there. And, uh, but still, they, we, we sent them there. We had a therapy center also, but we ma made them sit in the classroom along with the other children. They have faced a lot of problems, a lot of discrimination. We have faced a lot of challenges. When our, uh, uh, because we sent the children to a proper school, the, 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 ho the, the home, the institution where we are, 
were uh, were was not happy because they had never sent the children to school, and that is why they felt that uh, in fact our funding was stopped because of that, and they blamed us for sending the children to school because while while in school, one of the child who was going to the washroom was uh, was sexually abused. Now they blamed the 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 rehabilitation project saying that because you have you are sending the children to school that is why they have this has happened and the the next day the cwc passed an order stopping education and stopping counseling so our counselors were thrown out and the and the children were uh, kept inside locked they were not allowed to go to school school stopped that was the exam time and still the children were they were very upset in fact you should have seen the children when they went to school for the first time they were so excited so happy they had never been to school we have pictures of them going to school and when they came back when this was stopped absolute it was court direction which said to start the school again to start the counseling again and the and to give them special exams because they had missed the exam one of the students stopped the exam along in in a class of what they call normal children he was a, he was branded as an intellectually um, challenged child now this was the situation and in that situation where we are unwanted unwelcome we are facing so many challenges over there we the our funding was also stopped because the home said we will do all these things they are just duplicating what we are doing we are doing all these things so the funding was stopped we got another funding and the matter went on the the rehabilitation project is going on after all this what we realized was still after 3 years many of our recommendations have not been complied with every time we go to the court the uh, the 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 government comes with a very about 300 pages of a report of compliances and what the compliances are a letter has been sent to so and so another letter has been sent to the health department and these are the and letters have gone but what has happened we don't know so we told them we do not want this kind of compliances what we want is what has happened to the children how the children have benefited from what you have done those kind those kinds of compliances are still to come in all this that was happening we heard abuse happening in another institution in matunga in in this scenario we we suggested to the court we went through the justice verma committee report i would like to share with you quickly i know it's time uh, justice verma committee report on page 57 to 60 paragraphs 57 to 60 justice verma has said that um, uh, that there is sheer abuse in the institutions in view of that they recommend that all children's homes observation homes juvenile homes and women's protective homes to be placed under the legal guardianship of the high court this is what justice verma had said and they said that um, uh, that the registrar of the high court will be the one who will be monitoring it i'm not reading the entire para you can see 57 to 60 justice verma committee report we felt that now is the time to tell that the court to consider this that please um, take up so many abuses happening in spite of uh, so many uh, two years three years we have been going to the court regularly every month the matter comes up the lot of directions are there i have been complied with but there are majority of them which are still to be complied with for instance there were no rules in maharashtra uh, J on the jj act when we had taken up this matter because of a court direction the jj rules were formulated we have requested the court uh, that the court has given a direction that in every government hospital there will be a pediatric unit in which intellectually challenged children who have been abused will be kept because till then they were sent to an adult psychiatric department so our children initially were kept in the adult psychiatric department and the when the court when we reported to the court the court said no throughout maharashtra all children will be in pediatric uh, unit where they'll be uh, they will be kept there so that is a direction for all the institutions in maharashtra we have got good directions but in spite of that as preeti rightly said yes we did tell the court just as varma has recommended this please consider it i'm a bad moderator i should learn from rahul um no i uh, yeah uh, my my okay i'm 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 
cutting short everything but you still have to extend it by 10 minutes otherwise these powerful women are not going to step down okay so enakshi no no it's okay we are uh, enakshi enakshi if if we were to and this question is also open to all of you if i were to ask you if you were to enter as a, a shelter home and if what are the five things you would see in a shelter home to say well this is a safe place for this child that i am recommending my goodness uh, post uh, enakshi um, people from the audience can also see, give us uh, no there's there's um, i think the question that you had asked me in my questions was a very important question i'm going to ask um, you that as well no because the the important thing is there are kids in an institution the very nature of as an institution as i had I have said earlier is there is a paternalism there is a power there is it patriarchal now that is the nature of an institution and while in institutionalization is a last resort there will be institutions and children will have to be kept in institutions having said that um the first uh answer to any kind of abuse in an institution is denial i think that's if uh, with arya nathala we our problem was not that there was prob there, there was in abuse i'm sure there will be abuse but how are we going to deal with that abuse is the first question that we need to ask so therefore what are the standards standards of care that we are going to protect put in place first is transparency how most institutions are closed no one is allowed in unless you have a court order so how open are these institutions um uh, secondly how trained are the professionals thirdly you know we we don't even look at cleanliness as an inst- if you go into any institution it's dark it's dingy the windows are closed the toilets are stinking so and it breeds contempt for each other and contempt for one's own self so uh, is the institution teaching the child to respect its himself and herself and every and its ar- and their surroundings so given all of that i think transparency and accountability systems within the institution is the first thing i will look for is it in place um i'm going to request uh, siddharth to just display a poster in the meanwhile anybody wants to add to this list and simultaneously you can look at this poster this was in holding a giant size bigger than larger than lal bagh cha raja that giant size hold uh, size holding in the city of mumbai in thana in navi mumbai and it had this statement put a name and face to your support meet and bond with her as a child welfare committee member if you were to see such a poster what would be your reaction and this poster was um for uh, put up for a uh, part of a fundraising campaign Paternalistic for a child care institution uh, one first of all confidentiality is gone because uh, child's face is there on the poster that is important thing uh so it, no this is very serious poster one should not put th- this poster like this and definitely it is uh, as she said it is donations in cash and kind will come only that is important in that uh, poster so definitely it is highly objected poster yeah i understand uh actually uh, if as a cwc i enter in any um, children home then i will see if a child comes to you and makes a mischief of his age or her age then it is a good children home that is very important for me uh, and uh, as a child welfare committee i will see whether complaint box is put suggestion box is put uh, the suggestion box is proper and the chits are not tutored definitely as a child welfare committee we will open that box and see whether the complaints or suggestions have been put by the children and by that complaint box one can understand or suggestion box one can understand uh, what is the standard of care uh, in that children home uh, another important thing is placing the board in the uh, Uh, in the children home uh, explaining about the phone number of child line and phone number of police stations and phone numbers of child welfare committee uh, so with that uh, one can understand uh, what is the standard of care in child uh, in that institution yeah thanks thanks manisha meet and bond with her 
I just thought this was, you know, a pedophile children, in, uh, people interested in exploiting children would just catch that message and say, well, if I can give money and have access to children, then this is the place where I should be going. Uh, we have a mandatory reporting clause in, in yeah. POXO and recently um, a home that Suchismita, Janvi and I were discussing about, uh, we... Uh, Exactly, I think 15 days ago, the superintendent of that home got arrested for uh, not reporting a case of child sexual abuse where I think the, uh, the watchman of the home uh, sexually assaulted a girl in that shelter home. So, uh, what do you, I mean, this question is open to anybody can pick it, anybody from the audience as well. What do you think? Is mandatory reporting going to it's, help? It's, it's not going to help. It's... um. Let's 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 look at two two aspects to childhood. One is exploratory sexual activity. Now, what is our take going to be on that? You put fifty children together, and are you going to say they cannot explore? They they can they don't we don't deal with their sexuality, or are we going to say how are we going to deal with that sexuality? That's the first question. Now, the law is very confusing but the law says any sexual activity below the age of 18 is criminalized. So actually every sexual activity whether in a home or outside and more so in a home because in a closed space now becomes a criminal activity. So it's criminalized. So that's one level of it and then there is of course the offense part of it. Older child, younger child, warden, caretaker, watchman as you're saying. So there are several dimensions that we are looking at and each of them have to be addressed differently. Um, there are moral arguments, there is a legal argument. So each, to my, actually if you ask me and I hope they know, are there any reporters here? <laughs> well, I'll be arrested. There are, I do not report every sexual activity between two young people. I do not. If it is told to me in confidence, I leave it at that. If they do not see, a, the violence has to be manifested by the child to say, I am violated. And if the child is saying, I am violated, we have to listen. But if the child does not, if it is, I know there is no consensual activity as far as POXO goes, but there is a level of consensual activity that is also happening. So this mandatory reporting is, you know, quite tricky and in the in the context of India where we do not have any systems in place, we have no victim protection, we have no protection for the child, uh, there is greater, uh, there is a backlash that the child might have to deal with and the, vic and, the, and the reporter might have to deal with, I do not, and there is a penal provision attached to mandatory pro uh, reporting, it is a very um, unthought out provision at the moment as I see it at the moment unless we can work this around and I don't know about any other state but in Delhi the superintendent is not even allowed to sign the vakalat nama for the child so there's no clarity as to who is the guardian of this child so then you know in that case who are you rep who is this who's going to represent this child where are you going to take this child and and to my mind shutting down institutions is not the solution it is taking cognizance of the problem, confronting it and, and using the rule of law to ensure that things are in place. That is my solution, just shutting down, moving the children out, taking them away. That is just brushing the solution, it is putting the, put it under the carpet for me. Uh, and actually just to continue on that, we also have licensing, we have visiting, visiting. everything. You know, we are, we are trying to get licensing of shelter home. There are people who are visiting, high court people visiting, Department of Women, special committees set up. Uh, the new trend is that you would get a license only if you have a child protection policy. So now we have a whole lot of consultants who are helping child care institutions draft those child pr protection policies only so that they can get this, this license. But in spite of all that, we are seeing... Uh, like the case in Pune, that's a very well established organization, has a license in place, is receiving government grants, government officials visiting them, but despite that we saw a case of child sexual abuse there. So is this helping? What more needs to be done? 
to prevent yes uh, in keeping with international standards poxo did bring in mandatory reporting but not in keeping with international practices they d we were not prepared for it there no res proper resources were kept for it there had to be training before for all the mandatory reporters in fact in may various countries laws there are reporters who have been mandatory reporters who have been identified and who have been trained in fact uh, the employers have been given a mandatory duty to train them and also they have to give it a certificate and they have to certify that so and so is a trained mandatory reporter and that is, and, and there has to be resources infrastructure as as inakshi said victim protection and then only the mandatory reporting is successful regarding protection policy yes you every institution in the best standards in the best interest must have a protection policy but this policy must be understood disseminated by the staff by the employer by the trustee all of them should be covered by this policy and they should understand it implement it and force it and also they should see to it that um, in case of any violation of this policy strict action is taken whoever is responsible for it the policy is not only on paper it has to be enforced understood disseminated uh, any questions yeah, yes hi i'm chandni um, for very many years now many of us have heard that there has been a great deal of physical or emotional abuse in children's homes or neglect or the services provided there are not very useful or effective i mean it's not something that we are surprised about or whatever it took a death in delhi and uh, mumbai mirror expose in bombay for intervention to happen in two of two children's homes not to suggest that other children's homes are uh, not having any intervention or are not improving but it, it really makes me wonder i mean we have we seem to have no mechanism for uh, observation for supervision for offering constructive criticism to fellow ngos fellow children's homes fellow therapists lawyers uh, trainers and i wonder whether 30 years from now also we might be uh, complaining about how schools and neighborhoods are not open to prevention programs and so there needs to be a great deal of awareness and also the services being offered by uh, practitioners by therapists are either uh, prohibitively expensive or uh, just not very effective or there are inarticulate counselors i'm just maybe i'm sounding too cynical but i'm just thinking that i'm hearing things that i've heard 15 years ago and not much seems to have changed and not to suggest that there there isn't i mean this discourse is extremely important of course we need to flag each of these issues but i think we need to move towards far more concrete problem solving approaches identify the small and big things that need to be done online offline one one survivor at a time or one institution at a time or one ngo at a times so it's not really a question but you can still choose to respond to any of that i heard from the panel was that there was change happening of course they pointed out a lot of things that went wrong in those cases but if you paid attention to what inakshi said what manisha tai said where there was an advisory committee that was put in place there were civil society organizations that were engaged in this process there was a child welfare committee that actively engaged an organization uh, and gave them the legitimate position of the support person which poxo does uh, and same in case of hug center where they worked with the police and went into this institution and made sure that happens so i think we must have i mean i wasn't uh, born or uh, when 30 years ago when you know these things were being discussed but i think there has been change and one sees change what we are discussing here is really how do we now take that change to the next level so there are systems in place there are procedures in place there are superb institutions in mumbai i invite you to visit some of them 
you must visit them I in think delhi i'm sure have an opportunity to visit each other's work and give each other feedback that can just help us become better in our work absolutely and i think if that if we can develop a mechanism for some of that to happen it will just really be beneficial to the entire community and all the stakeholders involved sure. and i really mean it i mean i, I, I as a, for instance as a sexuality educator how would you know whether to invite me to do a session in your school or the several other sexuality educators that exist you currently don't seem to have a mechanism because you have heard me a little bit but you haven't heard or you don't even know who all the other people in the space are necessarily and you can't gauge the quality or effectiveness of their work because we just don't seem to have enough of the process and the outcomes documented the vision and mission etc of a website is not able to demystify just how i mean see that's fantastic uh, you know the suggestion so, well received you know next year's agenda please put that in 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 remember in social change there's a there, i i can never say it in french but what it means is the more it changes the more it remains the same the more it changes it remains the same because the world is also changing and and how we look at the world is also changing and the demands that we make from each one of us and from the institutions is also changing so as we pick the standards higher it seems that it is not changing but we are sort of you push with a finger and it keeps going a little bit and the fact is that today we talk about it you know uh, otherwise charles dickens had to write about it so we we talk about it we talk about it in the open and i i i i i have the courage to sit here and say that uh, yes the political powers that be were uh, threatening she can say this i i don't i think those are very small markers social change is so slow 35 years yeah yeah i i think you know the fact that we got to know so many uh, violations in shelter home itself says that there is change because people are looking people are watching people are talking so definitely yesterday there was a discussion panel discussion on media rahul didn't allow me to ask me ask that question at that point in time so i'm going to use this space to ask that question and then we'll wrap up there was one more poster for your next year uh, this no no i'm going to show that poster nonetheless um, you know media we all want to work with them but very naively one young media person was saying how she went with chocolates and biscuits and she put an arm around children to get them to disclose uh, their trauma and the violation that was happening in the shelter home uh, somewhere you know one of you or anybody in the audience what do we think about these you know these practices not just among media people but more so among media people you know this whole thing of body touch and we are here talking about child sexual abuse we are talking about children not being happy with body touch we are talking about children also wanting that body touch so where do we draw the line how you know are we confusing children i keep talking about this chocolate story where you teach children don't take a chocolate from a stranger or somebody whom you know be cautious think why he is giving you this chocolate and here there are these people luring children to give out stories so if anybody wants to react anybody in the audience wants to react and for suchasmita till then uh this is a poster we were in cambodia about a year ago and cambodia is facing a huge problem called orphanage tourism and maybe we can talk about it next year is it also are we experiencing it here at home children are being trafficked in cambodia these are orphanages but more than 50% of the children in these orphanages have parents they are not orphans there are tourist guides who arrange for tours to these orphanages you go to hotels and you'd find pamphlets which tell you you know that we'll arrange tours for you when we were staying in one hotel there was this couple who was telling you know i'll give 100 100 take me you know in your plan i don't see a visit to this orphanage so this you know this this luring this access to children just because oh, i, just I have i have the purchasing power uh, at some stage we need to introspect and see whether we are also somewhere you know uh, following the 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 so called what is happening in cambodia if we don't have the time this time but next time certainly but about media if anybody has anything to say and maybe we can wrap up this panel discussion before 
we are physically picked up from here and thrown out. <laughs> Anybody? Media? No. Everybody is tired. Oh, there was a time you would just go anything to do with media, any unethical practice. But there Nobody? are media guidelines. Yeah. The government yeah. of India has media See, guidelines. See, there are several guidelines. That's the problem. How do we follow it? I think you know, for a good story, I don't remember any guidelines. It's no, the problem is that uh, they'll often tell you, but you have to show me the child. Yes. And I have to do this constant war that you will not see the child. You, you will not see the child. That's just that it. Because otherwise, this voyeuristic need of the entire country, it's not real unless there is a face. So that is something, I don't know, it's, it's a big big dilemma there is at the one time and on the one hand we do need the support for all these institutions to run properly and we do, do need transparency and we do need visitors but we don't need visitors who are going there for voyeuristic reasons and to, you know and children do not want to be touched by arbit people i'm sorry i think they choose who they want to be touched by i think uh, very quickly i think each one sitting here running an organization working directly or indirectly with children needs to ask ourselves do we have a child protection policy in our organization that we follow to the t do we allow access uh, unsupervised open access to strangers in our shelter homes, our daycare centers, etc. And we could be working in the recreational space. And I think that's something that we all need to start thinking about. Because yesterday when they said we could get into the shelter home, put our arms around, I was thinking, hang on a second, where was the superintendent? Where was the staff? Did they even know about a child protection policy? Did they even sign something? Were they even given any kind of induction and orientation? So it actually goes both ways. And we, we need to start thinking about that as a community, not only working with children. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Foundation, and thank you to all the panelists.